the bounty hunters. We finally got a live one. We got her good and drunk. First we're gonna rob her, and then we're gonna... The slamming of the door behind them cuts of the men singing together with glee as they carry their newest capture right into the chain breaker without any resistance but a lot of cheers from the onlookers. One more bounty, this one worth only a piddling half a million credits, and they leave the ship in high spirits to find either a cocky as hell, Tret, or another human waiting for them. I know you, Mr. T says, snapping his fingers. You, you're... Harold? Hank? Horace? Hoagie, Hoagie says. Isn't that a sandwich? Mustard asks. It's a nickname. I always went for a sandwich in training and tried to always make them as a sort of comfort food. They tried calling me sandwich for a while. The drill instructors tried to make shit sandwich stick, but it didn't flow. So I'm Hoagie. He explains and there are some snorts. Fair enough. Did we cross a line or... Pukey asks, and Hoagie shakes his head. Actually, I'm here to show you something. You see, each dock area's got a honking huge warehouse used as a scrap yard. Throw you junk in there and the station resells it at scrap value if we don't use it ourselves. It's a good way of getting rid of things you can't sell proper without dropping things in the space line to act like a relativistic landmine. Better manners to dump it in a place like this, you see. Hoagie explains. Makes sense. You're implying there's something interesting. Intact, it's fucking terrifying, but you chop it up and you've got a lot of decent parts, just not for what they were intended for. Hoagie explains, reaching up and drawing air quotes around intended. What is it? Bike asks. The worst shuttle ever. It's a piece of junk so poorly designed that even the most desperate will never use it out of atmosphere. Even then, they tend to fly these things close to the ground. Not bad for a shuttle rated for inner system transportation, eh? Okay. The fact that it sounds like a train wreck to be is fascinating, but is there something more to it? It may be a piece of shit, but it's in very good shape. Brand new, really. No one dares to actually use these things, which means the components, the engines, the flight computer, the stabilizers, the artificial gravity, atmospherics, radio, inertial dampeners, landing gear. The ship is completely intact. It's just not fit for purpose as a cross-system shuttle. It could easily be broken down for parts, say to soup up an air truck. Hoagie propositions and air far steps forward. What are these engines rated for? Inner system, planet to planet. This thing can safely land on a world and theoretically take off again and go to another one. But what makes it so terrible, Air Force presses. It's got nothing in the way of backups or wiggle room. If it's running at anything less than absolutely perfect peak performance, then the whole house of cards comes crashing down. There are no backups, no redundancies, and no room for failure. It can technically be used for purpose, but only if there's no such thing as random chance or unknown variables. So it's basically a massive game of chicken with both Murphy and the Reaper to fly it world to world. Air Force notes in thought. Yay, but the parts, if used on something smaller and with some proper backups, you want that Atertuck of yours to keep pace with starships? Because this thing's got the engines for it. Hell, just the sheer amount of metal in good condition alone is worth the price. Also, if you don't snatch it up, I will, and I'm going to convert it into a semi-mobile man cave. Hoagie mentions. Okay, you've made the sales pitch. You gonna show us this thing? Pukey asks, and Hoagie nods before leaning to the side and seeing Scaly. Who's the kid? I'm Scaly, he says. I can see that. What are you doing with these clowns? Hoagie asks. The ship used to be a slaver's vessel. They saved me. My actual name is Slithern, but they can't get the hisses right, shape of the tongue, so I'm Scaly. The kid explains, and Hoagie nods. Cool, I'm Commander Daniel Eastman, or Hoagie, Hoagie says, holding his hand out to Scaly, who takes it. The kid gets a firm handshake and a grin. Is that just the emergency promotion, or did you finish the training? Pukey asks. The training. 
The EFL does a fair amount of talking among ourselves, so we try to push one another to finish either the initial training or the catch-up courses, especially now that we're technically the first human extrasolar nation. We need to set a good example. Hoagie answers and Pukey nods. Good man. So let's see this thing, Pukey says, and Hoagie nods before gesturing for them to follow. He leads them through the docking area until they come to a large double door with the marking reading, Drops in Galactic Trade. Drops? Scaly asks and Hoagie shrugs. It's an in-joke that I don't get, he says leading them in. Holy shit, Pukey remarks as he sees the heaping mounds of different junked ship parts, broken weapons, random chunks of metal and busted furniture. There are dozens of them each one several stories tall and all of it shockingly new-looking. Yay, you guys should be thankful. We make a point of clearing out the organic waste piles every half day. Half the time it's burnt to ash, the other half it's shot for a round trip around the nearest star in a flying glass bulb and comes back fully rotted by the solar bombardment. Isn't that what you do with the sewage? Pukey asks, and Hoagie nods. Yep. He answers before jerking his head. This way. He leads them around the nearby weapon and scrap metal piles and then beyond a furniture heap to see. That doesn't look so bad, Airfar says as he sees the ship. It's vaguely shaped like a W on top of a square with clear hinges in the wings to allow it all to spread out and help with its profile. The individual components are fine as I said. That includes the hull and wings. It's just so badly put together that it barely works as intended, Hoagie remarks as he opens the door. Hey, this marking. It's in Meccan. Scaly notes as he sees a gear-like symbol on the wing. Good eye, kid. This thing was made in the Meccan reach, mostly due to loopholes. How's that work? Scaly asks. I'll explain in a bit. Come on in. Hoagie invites them and they pile in after him. The chamber's small and there's a lot of little cupboards and closet with a large plush chair in front of a control panel. Now, toss the place over with what you know about the tech and tell me what's missing, because this thing is completely up to specs, as terrifying as that is. Are we really? Pukey begins. The fuck? Air Force demands and everyone turns to see him with one of the rearmost panels open and his head stuck inside. He leans out with a puzzled look that has Hoagie scrambling for his communicator to snap a picture. It passes before he can get one. There's only one power siphon and no backups. No gas, no energy crystals, no solid fuel bricks, no wiring to suggest things like solar panels, no micro generators, no nothing. Ding, ding, ding. Major problem with the ship number one. It only has a single power source, no backups, no replacements, nothing for emergencies and no tools to fix it if it goes belly up. Hoagie explains. That's the theme here. The ship works, but there's no margin for failure. Thankfully, the parts are mech and standard so high quality for scrapping or upgrading. Just one engine too, kind of big for a ship this size, but just one. I'm not seeing maneuvering thrusters here, Scaly remarks as he looks in the closet at the back. Check the ceiling panels. This ship uses personal gravity manipulation to steer. There's another scare there. Hoagie prompts them, jerking his thumb upwards a few times to emphasize what he's saying. Beyond the power being a single accident away from gone and the engines following its big brother's example, J3 asks as he reaches up to unlatch a panel and pulls it out. He then blinks rapidly as he tries to process what he's seeing. Those are a lot of exposed wires. And if a single one is crossed, clipped, or shaken out of its connector, the steering takes a massive hit. Fuck me. The sniper breathes out with a somewhat scared expression. You're not pretty enough. Hoagie jokes and there are some snorts, then he points to their feet. Floor panels got life support on the left half and shielding on the right. The floors are pried up with ease and there are a series of muffled curses and impressed whistles. Okay, this shielding system is about as powerful as what I've got on our van. 
which granted is a little souped up for atmospheric flight alone. The fuck is this thing doing on a spaceship? Dong demands in disgust. Technically rated for micrometeors and re-entry, which is all it technically needs. There's nothing technical about this one, though. There's no backup here. No oxygen tanks, no atmosphere candles, not even O2 scrubbers or even a fucking gas mask if shit goes sideways. Just an algae scrubber system to take what you've breathed out and make it clean. If even a micro hole opens in the hull, this ship is hosed, Tang says. Okay, close up those nightmares gents. Pukey orders and the floor panels are shut. He steps forward and crosses his arms to give Hoagie a half-pissed, half-baffled look. The fuck is going on with this thing? I thought the mech in Reach was famous for its solid work. The components are solid. Each individual part is pristine and perfectly suited for purpose. Hoagie. All right, all right. This is due to legislation. In the mech and reach, ships are categorized by size with its largest dimension putting it in its legal category. Build long, tall, wide, or whatever, and the biggest one is counted for legal requirements on the ship. One of these requirements is a number of escape pods and shuttles. Otherwise, it can't legally be sold and you can be fined for flying an unsafe vessel in mech and space. You following? So far. Right. Well, this makes sense by itself. Bigger ships have a hell of a time landing on worlds and docking with stations, so the shuttles are practical. This mess is what happens when sensible legislation runs into an exception. Cargo haulers typically have huge hitch systems to latch onto their cargo regardless of size or make. The hitches are counted as part of the structure and they tend to kick a hauler up two or even three size categories. So this whole ship was designed to be the cheapest way possible to chase off paper pushers looking for a bribe, Air Force realizes. Exactly. And those paper pushers can't chase outside the mech and reach, meaning a lot of stations and scrapyards get these suckers dumped on us pretty regularly as the reach makes some of the best cargo haulers in the galaxy. So, this is the mint on a hotel room pillow. I gotcha. Makes a lot more sense now, Pukey remarks. So it's got some decent parts and it's going for scrap metal price? 2,000 credits, total. Yes, you're being fleeced, but it's pennies for you guys, and the parts are in honest-to-God good shape. Hoagie remarks with a grin and Pukey thinks. You know, it's a pretty good deal. Air Force begins and Pukey waves him off. Is there a second-hand tool pile nearby? I'll buy, but only if you let me store some things in here. By all means, the ship gets weighed then sold with these things averaging at around 2,000. Tip the scale and it's on you. You're admitting to us getting fleeced? Scaly asks with a baffled expression. Pirate station, kiddo. If you're looking for fair prices, start by stealing something. Hoagie remarks, and Air Force gives him a massive grin. Not from the station, though. Remember the rules. Pay your dues is number two. Nuts, the hat says, slipping his brass knuckles back into his pocket. Paying with someone else's wallet, though, is perfectly acceptable, isn't it? Scaly asks, and Hoagie nods. Then, today's salvage is on... Oh, woo. Ah, we. However the hell you pronounce this. You sneaky little shit, Hoagie says, taking the wallet and glancing inside. He lets out a piercing whistle when he spots the few coins before handing it back. Well, you ruined someone's day. Guess the kid's about to own this death trap. There are some chuckles as Scaly smugly pockets the stolen wallet.